us for our third midweek Lenten service. Uh, tonight we'll be using the service of Vespers again, as outlined on the on the little service guide that hopefully you picked up on the way in. Uh, we will be using Psalm 118 this evening, if you want to go ahead and mark that. Um, and I think our focus tonight is, is on Peter, uh, so a familiar part of the story, but uh, maybe a slightly different way of taking a look at it this evening. You'll hear more about that uh, during the sermon itself. With that, uh, by the way of introduction, then we begin with our opening <laughs> Endures forever. 
Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does value. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does value. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Holy God, mighty Lord, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. Your own Son has triumphed over sin and the grave and opened to us the gates of everlasting life. Purify our hearts in him that we may be granted a share in his glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn.
And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family in the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. The family of the Shimeites by itself and their wives by themselves. And all the families that are left, each to itself and their wives by themselves. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle letter is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And our final reading is from John's Gospel, the 18th chapter. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. O oh Lord, 
have mercy on me. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation.
But beyond the courtyard, there is grace. Grace for Peter and grace for you. But first, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the previous night in the upper room where we hear the claim, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Oh, Peter. Jesus and Peter had been through so much together. Three years earlier, Jesus was walking on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus sees Peter fishing there with his brother Andrew, and he calls them to follow. I will make you fishers of men, he says. One day, about a year later, Peter follows Jesus onto the Sea of Galilee during a huge storm. Peter walks on the water. And then he begins to sink. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand, takes hold of Peter, and saves him. At one point, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. At another point, Jesus takes Peter, along with James and John, to see his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then, Jesus invites this same trio to witness his, his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And knowing Peter as we have from Scripture, maybe we're not all that surprised to hear him make the claim, I will lay down my life for you. You know, we've all made that claim. Yeah, we have. When we got confirmed, do you intend to live according to the Word of God? And in faith, word and deed remain true to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? And we all said, I do. Will you take this man to be your wedded husband? And you ladies said, I do. Will you take this woman to be your wedded wife? And the men, and the men said, I do. All the claims we have made. The claim, the claim, the claims. But it's also easy, isn't it? At least to make the claim. As the events in the courtyard that evening unfold, I would liken it a little bit to watching cracks beginning to show up in the foundation of a home. And those cracks begin to spread and to widen. A servant girl comes up to Peter and says, Hey, you're one of his followers, right? And Peter says, No, no, I am not. The first crack surfaces. Peter then stands by the fire, warming himself. And some bystanders say to him, You're one of his followers, aren't you? He quickly denied it and said, I am not. A second crack grows, and they both begin to widen. And the structure grows weaker. Then, one of Malchus's relatives spots Peter and says, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter denies knowing Jesus once again in spite of all the eyewitnesses. And at once, the rooster crowed. Let those words sink in and imagine what it must have been like for Peter. Jesus had told him before the rooster crows. And now, And the result, guilt. Guilt. For us, crack 
hearts begin and open up whenever we say or think just one more drink or just one more little story or lie or just one more little fling or flirtatious moment just one more look But the one leads to another one more. And then just one more after that. And, there's, and then somewhere along the way, perhaps it's the rooster of our conscience crowing, but then the G word, guilt. Anybody in here love leftovers? Not me. Lord knows I eat enough of them. And they're not all bad. But, come on. Even I tired of almost anything. I remember one year, a number of years ago, our chest freezer was pretty empty. So after a, well, let's just say less than successful Krispy Kreme donut fundraiser, our freezer was filled with donuts. And in pretty short order, no one in the congregation was pleased to hear that we still have donuts. And now that the kids are gone, well, let's just say that a 19-pound turkey goes a little too far for just Becky and I. Now, I like turkey. But after hot turkey sandwiches, after turkey pot pie, turkey soup, barbecued pulled turkey sandwiches, something called a turkey casserole, well, I think I actually started having nightmares about a 1,900-pound turkey chasing me down. And in some odd sort of way, I bet Peter, after the rooster crowed, felt like a leftover. A has-been, a marginalized, left-out, rejected leftover, soon to be forgotten on the back shelf in the refrigerator. You see, that's kind of what guilt does to us. Guilt turns us into miserable, weary, angry, duplicitous, stressed out people. But you know who loves leftovers? God does. And God gives the other G word, grace. Grace. Did someone say grace? How, how, how does that happen? How is that in view tonight? Well, if we'll fast forward a bit in the story to John chapter 21, we'll find Jesus in a charcoal fire, not unlike the one there that evening. And we find Jesus asking Peter if he loves him. Jesus asks the question three times, once for every time Peter had denied knowing him. And each time Peter confesses, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And along the way, Peter effectively confesses his guilt. What gave him the faith to do that? Well, while Peter was denying Jesus, Jesus was suffering for Peter. You see, Jesus doesn't wait until we get our acts all together. 
Jesus doesn't wait until we overcome our temptations and fight our demons and conquer our sins. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In our courtyards, we know, we see guilt. But beyond the courtyard, at the cross, we see grace. And grace means what? Grace means forgiveness. It means restoration. It means the wayward child being received back as a beloved memory, a member of the family. And it marks the comeback. Who preaches the great sermon on Pentecost? Peter. Whose sermon converts 3,000 people that day? Peter's. Who writes two of the books of the New Testament? Peter. Listen closely. Comebacks don't depend on how much we love Jesus. Comebacks depend on how much Jesus loves us. Comebacks don't depend on what we do for Jesus. Comebacks depend on what Jesus does for us. Comebacks don't depend on us giving our life for Jesus. Comebacks depend on Jesus giving his life for us. Remember that character from earlier in the sermon, Black Bart? He was, in the end, really nothing to be afraid of. When the authorities finally tracked him down, they didn't find a bloodthirsty bandit. They found a mild-tempered businessman from Decatur, Illinois. The man pictured storming through the Wild West on his horse was so afraid of riding horses that he rode around in a horse-drawn buggy. Black Bart was Charles Boyles, the bandit who never once fired a bullet because he never once loaded his gun. So see guilt for who and what it really is. A deadly monster, you bet. A painful feeling that can do great harm? Absolutely. The tormentor of our souls? Count on it. But also know this. Guilt is a defeated enemy who has no bullets left in his gun. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that our story isn't over when Jesus is in it. And isn't that great? We too, like Peter, can all come back from guilt. How? By the very best G word of all, by grace. Through faith, on account of Jesus the Christ. By grace. Amen. We stand for the versicle on page 231 and then the hymn. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
Please stand for prayer that begins with the Kyrie. Be with you. 